so the some of the questions that I, or all of the questions that I've already done are in part one of the video. So if you see a question on here that's done but I didn't talk about in your class, then you go back to part one and watch it there. All right, so go back and fill in the rest. What is the probability that three pennies tossed in the air will land all heads facing up? So I have three events. The probability of the first penny being heads up is one half. Second one is one half. Third one is one half. I multiply all those together. That is not one sixth. It is one eighth. That's my answer. Okay, so I did number two. Let's look at number three. A game requires rolling a six-sided die and spinning a spinner. The spinner has four equal sections, red, blue, yellow, uh, green, and yellow. What is the probability of spinning the color blue and rolling a six? So this has two events. They are independent, so spinning the color blue, since they are equal sections, it's one out of four. Rolling a six, there's one out of six chance of that happening. Multiply them together, I get one out of 24. Okay, I did four, five, and six, I believe, in all classes today. All right, so number seven. There are 12 boys and 14 girls in Ms. Tremont's geometry class. Find the number of ways Ms. Tremont can select four students from the class to work on a group project. Okay, now since I don't care, since I'm not giving them roles, um, you know, jobs or president, vice president, that sort of stuff, I just need four students. It does not matter what order they're in. So since the order that doesn't matter, it is a combination. So this is a combination. The total here is 26. Right? So it's a combination of 26 students taken four at a time for a group. So your combination formula, remember, is C, uh, n things taken r at a time. And that is equal to n factorial over r factorial times n minus r factorial. So my n here is 26, so this is going to give me 26 factorial over 4 factorial times 26 minus 4 factorial. All right, that's going to give me 26 factorial over 4 factorial, 22 factorial. I start expanding the top, 26 times 25 times 24 times 23 times 22 factorial over 4 factorial 22 factorial. Then these will cancel out, which leaves me with 26 times 25 times 24 oops, times 23 over, and I expand the denominator, 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Then I can reduce this some more. Let's see, three goes, or let's start with four. Four goes into 24 six times. Three goes into, it doesn't go into 26, doesn't go into 25, doesn't go into 23, but it does go into six twice. And then I can go ahead and knock this two out with that two, or I could take half of 26. doesn't matter. I'll just go ahead and knock out that two right there. So what I'm left with multiplying, then, all the denominator is gone. So this is really just 26 times 25 times 23. And this is one of those situations where you're capable of multiplying those, or at least you should be. But if we have a calculator, that's fine too. And we multiply all that together, and that's going to give me 14,950. And then what is the probability that Susie, Victoria, James, and Christopher are the group of four? Now, when I wrote this question, I was trying to make this a combination of combinations. And that's not what I ended up writing. Um, so let's just talk about that real quick. If, well, let's do the probability first, then we'll talk about it. It says, what is the probability that Susie, Victoria, James, and Christopher are the group of four? Those names are really irrelevant in this case because that's just one group of four. That is one of the 14,950 choices that we have. So that probability that that, that is the group of that one would be one out of 14,950. And 
and that is the probability. What I was trying to do and totally didn't end up doing was making it a combination of combinations. So if I had said, um, how many different ways could she select for students if she wanted two girls and two boys? And then that's that combination of combinations. That was the last example on your notes for that day. And um, so I would do the combination of boys, 12 taken two at a time, because I'd want two boys and two girls. Uh, so 12 taken two at a time, and girls, 14 taken two at a time, and then multiply the two together. Um, so make sure that you've got the combination of combinations down as well. All right, number eight. In how many ways can eight students form a single file line? So there's a couple of different ways to do this. This is a, a permutation because it order matters. It's how many different ways can we form a single file line? So the line leader is different and so forth and so on. So this is a permutation of eight things taken eight at a time. And I can put it through the permutation formula. Permutation formula, remember, is n things taken r at a time. So this would be n factorial over n minus r factorial. So I can totally do that and get 8 factorial divided by 8 minus 8 factorial. And 8 minus 8 is 0, so this is 8 factorial over 0 factorial. But remember, 0 factorial is just 1, so this really ends up being 8 factorial. Another way to look at this, you could use counting principle here, and that's fine. It, it works out to kind of be the same thing. I've got 8 places in line. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so when I go in the first person line, there's eight choices of who that could be. Then that person's standing in line. Then there's seven choices for this spot. Six, five, four, three, two, one. And then you multiply them all together. And when you do that, what you get is eight factorial. That's what that means. And so whether you do it this way or this way, you get the same answer. And that answer is 40,320. Okay, Joe has five shirts, six trousers, three ties, and four sport coats. How many different out can outfits can he wear? Not a permutation or combination. It's not probability. This is counting principle. He's got to pick a shirt, trousers, a tie, and a sport coat. So he has five shirts to choose from, six trousers, three ties, and four sport coats. And then we multiply all those together, and you've got 360 different outfits that he wears, or that he could wear. He may not match, but that's what we could get. All right, so then... Locker combination system uses three digits from zero to nine. How many different three-digit combinations with no digits repeated are possible? So even though this is a locker combination, this is a permutation because order does matter here. So this is a permutation of, so digits zero to nine, that is a total of 10. I'm only using three at a time. And then I wrote the permutation formula up there. And we've got 10 factorial divided by, and then it's n minus r factorial, 10 minus 3 factorial. So this is 10 factorial divided by 7 factorial. So it gives me 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 factorial divided by 7 factorial. Knock those two out. 9 times 8 is 72, times 10 is 720. All right, so we've already, I've already done 11B. Again, I may not have done it every class. You definitely want to go and look at this whole reducing thing if that's blowing your mind. Um, on the, watch the video if you haven't done that already. Okay, so I'm going to kind of separate this so I don't mix up my work. All right, so I'm going to the probability that a point chosen at random in each figure lies in the shaded region. Okay, so here on A, I have a regular hexagon and um, inside of a rectangle. So what I want is, I want the probability of the shaded region, and that's going to be equal to the area of the shaded region over the area of the rectangle. Now, to find the area of the shaded region, i got a couple of options here. This is a regular hexagon. And so I can find the area of the regular hexagon, I can subtract it from the rectangle, and I can go there. Let's say that I don't really remember necessarily the um, formula for the area of a regular hexagon, but I know some stuff about it. Let's look at a different way that we could actually get this shaded region. 
because if this is a rectangle, these are little right triangles, right? And um, all four of them would be congruent because it's, an, it's a, a regular polygon. So inside that rectangle, those four little triangles would have to be the same. And I may, maybe I don't remember the formula, and I'm not giving you a formula chart. I mean, we could totally use the formula, and it's fine. But let's think about what we know about a hex bond. I know that if I draw in this, that side length is 12 here, right? And I don't even necessarily have to find the apothem right here. We don't remember how to do that, or, or should remember how to find it, but maybe not remember the, the formula itself. That's okay. In a hexagon, the angles up here are 60 which means that since these are isosceles, these end up being equilateral triangles. So all three of these little things are 60. I'm sorry, all, all three of the angles are 60, and all three of the sides are 12. So this side right here is 12 also. Now, if this angle right here is 60, which it is because these are equilateral, and this angle right here is 60, then this angle right here, for that to be 180, this also has to be 60. That gives me some information here. Because if I look at just that shaded triangle, look what happens. Here's my shaded triangle. This is 12. It's the hypotenuse, and I'm getting that from right here. This angle is 60, and I know that because these two are both 60, so that's giving me the 180. And I need, if I'm just going to look at the triangles, I need both sides of the triangle. Well, this is a 30, 60, 90 triangle. If this is 60 and that's 30, then across from 30 is your S, this is 2s, and this is s squared of 3. So if this is 12, this is 6, and this is 6 squared of 3. So for the area of the shaded region, I could do, I have two choices. I could do the area of the shaded region is equal to the area of the rectangle minus the area of the hexagon. That works. Or, area of the shaded region is equal to four times the area of little triangle, of the shaded triangle. So I think I'm going to do it that way, just so that you can see different ways to approach things. I don't have to use that. I mean, I did, actually, I did have to use the hexagon, but I didn't have to use the area of it. <clears throat> All right, so the area of a triangle is one-half base times height. The base of this triangle is six. The height of the triangle is 6 squared of 3. So 6 times 6 is 36. Half of that is 18. So the area of the triangle is 18 squared of 3. Okay. So then I can come back over here and plug it in right here. And the area of the shaded region is equal to 4 times the area of the triangle, which is 18 squared of 3. So you can double it and double it again. That gives you 36 and 72. Or you can do 4 times 10, which is 40. 4 times 8, which is 32. That still gives you 72. So the area of the shaded region is equal to 72 square root of 3. So there's the area of my shaded region. I also need the area of my rectangle. Right? So i got to make sure that I know the side lengths of my rectangle. And this is 12. I already knew that. This side is this piece right here, because I just took that triangle out. And it's 6, so this is 6, which means this over here is 6. This is 6 squared of 3, which means this is 6 squared of 3, which means this is 6 squared of 3. So as far as side lengths are concerned, this whole side length here is 12 squared of 3, and this whole side length here is 6 and 6 and 12, which is 24. So now to find the area of my rectangle, that is just base times height. So that's going to give me the base, which is 24, times the height, which is 12 square root of 3. So 24 is 2 times 12. So 2 times 12 times 12. 12 times 12 is 144, times 2 is 288. So the area of my rectangle is 288 square root of 3. Now, 
to actually do the probability part, which I decided what that was up here before I started so I wouldn't get lost in all this and forget to do it. The probability that it's in the shaded region is equal to the area of the shaded region, which is 72 square root of 3, over the area of the rectangle, which is 288 square root of 3. So I can reduce kind of like I did over here. They're both even numbers. Okay, and I, so I'm not going to worry about what divides into what and whatever else. I mean, you can if you see numbers. Square roots of 3, those are just going to cancel out. Those are gone. That's great. So then at 72, if I divide it in half, I'm going to get 36 over half of 288 is 144. They're still even, so I divide them in half again. I'm going to get 18 over 72. Okay, still even. So this is going to give me 9 over 36. Now I get to something that might be a little bit more recognizable. The final answer is not 4. Yes, 9 goes into 36 four times, but your final answer is 1 fourth, which is 0.25, which is 25%. And on the test, it will tell you which ones you have to do all 3, 4, and which ones you have to do just 1. And if all you did here was the fraction, it's absolutely fine. I just went ahead and wrote in all of them. Okay, number 12. A fair, coin, a fair coin is tossed three times. What's the probability that the coin will land tails up on the second toss? Okay, so it is tossed three times. All I want is the probability that it will land tails up on the second one. Well, the first toss and the third toss don't affect this one at all because they are independent events. So your answer is one half. Square dartboard is represented on the accompanying diagram. The entire dartboard in the first quadrant is from x equals 0 to 6, from y equals 0 to 6. The triangular region on the dartboard is enclosed by the graphs of the equations y equals 2, x equals 6, y equals x. Find the probability that a dart that randomly hits the dartboard will land in the triangular region formed by the three lines. Okay, so we have to know how to graph lines. We have to be able to graph them correctly. y equals 2 is a horizontal line. Here is y equals 2. X equals 6 is a vertical line. Here is X equals 6. Y equals X is the parent function, which comes here like this. It doesn't necessarily have to be dotted. I just don't think I could have drawn it straight if I didn't do that. So I'm not even going to change it. Um, it tells me it's a triangular region, and it is bounded by those three lines. This I do not shade in because this isn't bounded by them. It's bounded by this one down here as well, so this would actually go on forever, and that's the only one. This is the triangle that I'm looking for here. So I want to know the probability that a dart that it randomly hits the dartboard will land in the triangular region formed by the three lines. So what I'm looking for here is the probability of the shaded region, okay, which is going to be the area of the triangle over the area of the rectangle which is actually a square. Does it even refer to that as a rectangle? I don't think so. We'll just go ahead and call it a square. Then. So, got to find the area of a triangle. So, area of the triangle is a one-half base times height. This length right here is one, two, three, four. The height is one, two, three, four. So, this is going to give me one-half times four times four which is 8. That is the area of your triangle. Then I also need the area of the rectangle. I'm sorry, well, it's the square. I'm going to call it the square. It is a rectangle, but square is a better name. So area of the square, which is side squared, and that would be 6 squared, so that is 36. That is the area of the square. So now that I've found my pieces, area of the triangle is 8 over the area of the square, which is 36. So I can reduce that. They're both even, so that's 4 over 18, which is then 2 over 9. All right, number 14. A bag contains 12 red M&Ms, 12 blue M&Ms, and 12 green M&Ms. What is the probability of drawing two M&Ms of the same color in a row when the first M&M is drawn, it is looked at and eaten. So the only reason that this is enough information when it just says two same color in a row and we would get the same answer no matter what color is because there's the same amount of each color. If 
there was not the same amount of each color, then which um, which two we get would make the probabilities different. But we're good. All three of them together, or all three colors together, that gives me a total of 36. So I'm drawing two. These are dependent events because I'm going to take it out and I'm going to eat it. And so the probability of getting one color, right, is going to be whatever color it is. Let's go with red, blue. It doesn't matter because it'll be the same. I got, it's 12 out of 36. It's the probability of getting that one color. Then I eat it. And then I reach back into the bag and get this next color in a row. So there's only 35 left. And since I'm getting the same color, there's only 11 of those left. So then I can reduce before I multiply, maybe, or I can just go ahead and multiply. I can reduce. I, 12 over 36, that actually reduces to one-third. So then when I multiply straight across, 1 times 11 is 11 over 3 times 35. 3 times 30 is 90. 3 times 5 is 15, so that is 105. And there you go. All right, telephone company has run out of seven-digit phone numbers for an area code. To fix this problem, the company will now introduce a new area code. Find the number of new seven-digit telephone numbers that will be generated for the new area code if both of the following conditions must be met. The first digit cannot be zero or one. The first digit, the first three digits can't be the emergency number 911 or the information number 411. Okay, so we're just talking the, not the area code, but the seven digits. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven digits that I have to take care of. There are stipulations on the first digit and then also the first three digits together. There is no stipulation on these back here. So zero to nine, that means that there's going to be a ten, there's going to be ten possibilities for each of these digits, the last four digits. Okay, so let's talk about what's going on with the first three digits. Since the first three digits can't be 911, so 911, that knocks out a couple of choices here. But it doesn't mean I, I couldn't have it, I could have 511. Can't have 911 or 411, but I got a 511, so I can't really just say that there's only nine choices here. There's only nine choices here if the first number is nine or the first number is four. So I gotta be careful. This is, this is kind of a trickier one. It's, it's trickier than I intended it to be, a little bit more advanced. So we'll talk through it. Don't stress. It won't be on the test, but I do want you to think about this. I need to take out some of the possibilities when this is one, but not all of them. And same thing with the first digit. It can't be um, it can't be a zero or a one. So, in that I also have to worry about you know one 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 things like that. So I'm going to take out. I can take this out a couple of different ways. We can just go ahead and change the first digit. First digit cannot be zero or one. So that changes from ten to eight possibilities, right? It can be a nine or a four, but not if these right here are ones. So we're just going to go ahead and we'll leave this at eight. We'll just worry about this first little thing first and figure out how many there are. So let's just say the first digit cannot be zero or one, period, end of story. So now we have eight digits to choose from, not ten. These two, we're going to go ahead and use the ten because that doesn't go with this first stipulation. We'll come back and do something with this in just a minute. So if I multiply those together, and that gives me eight times, I gotta actually do this, times 10 times 10 times 10 four, four more times gives me eight million, okay? So I have eight million possibilities of phone numbers where just the first digit is not zero or one. Now, instead of trying to manipulate these numbers to take out the 911 and 411, I'm going to figure out how many possibilities there would be with that first number being 911 or 411. So if I look at another seven-digit phone number, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and when you think about the not part of it, you can kind of you can, we're going to be able to subtract them. Let's find out how many would have that as the beginning number. So that means the first digit being a nine or a four, that's two possibilities. That on both cases, the second digits would be a one, so that's just one possibility on each one of those. But still back here, 
I would still have all these 10 possibilities. And when I multiply all of those together, that gives me 20,000. So now all I have to do is subtract them. There are 20,000 of these 8,000 that wouldn't work, okay? Because these, this two is enclosed in here. So if I just subtract them and take my 8 million and subtract my 20,000, right? So 8 million minus 20,000 gives me 798. Oh, sorry, 7,980,000. That's my final answer for my possibilities. Now, the probability of me getting the phone number 8675309, that right there does not include 0 or 1 as the first digit. It does not include 911 or 411 here, so it definitely is a possibility. It is one of these possibilities here, so my answer is 1 out of 7,980,000. Let's look at 16. A bag of cookies contains 6 chocolate chip cookies, 5 peanut butter cookies, and 1 oatmeal cookie. Brandon selects 2 cookies at random. Find the probability that Brandon selected 2 chocolate chip cookies. All right, so we've got 6 chocolate chip, 5 peanut butter, and 1 oatmeal. That is a total of 12. So he's going to make two selections. He picks a probability that the first one is a chocolate chip cookie is 6 out of 12. Then, since he needs two of them, there's only 11 left to choose from and five chocolate chip ones. So then I'm going to multiply. I'm not going to equal. I'm going to multiply. I can reduce this. 6 out of 12 is 1 half. I can't reduce anything else. I multiply. This gives me 5 over 22. All right, so then what's the probability that he selects one chocolate chip and one peanut butter? So again, we have two possibilities here, or I'm sorry, we have two events. So probability of the first one being chocolate chip is 6 out of 12. Now there's only 11 left peanut butter cookies. There are five of them. And multiply, I end up with the exact same numbers as that I did up here, so my answer is 5 out of 22. I will finish the rest in the third video.